Okay, um, this is actually my third time attempting to record this because I keep getting interrupted. So this is the limited palette lecture that uh, I normally give to my class. And I usually pull it up and review it before we go into the third painting to just kind of remind you of some of the things that we've been trying to learn. So I wanted to make sure and get this online. And the nice thing is that I'll probably be able to put some things into it and say some things that I might not remember for all three classes. So limited palettes are basically used to kind of limit our color space. There's not a strict definition of like how many colors are in a limited palette or what they entail, um, but it's just the idea that the person who's using it has limited down the amount of colors that they're using in an effort to try and unify and control their palette and their painting a little bit better. So you can see that certain limited palettes, something like this might be better suited for um, doing uh, skin tones, certain types of skin tones, whereas another limited palette might be better suited to doing landscapes. You can see on this one, it's got all the greens and kind of these um, muted golds and so on. So that one and some of the blues are really nice. These pinks would be great for landscapes. So there's some nice things within this. Um, this palette right here is just showing a limited palette of four colors, basically with shades and tints mixed out from all of those. Um, this is an example of the Zorn palette, I, and a lot of these images are just pulled off the internet. They're images that I just have used to show as examples of different limited palettes to students so that you kind of understand the range. The Zorn palette is one that is actually really well known. It's named after an artist, um, Zorn, and it's made up of three colors, ivory black, yellow ochre, and cadmium red, and really you could say technically four colors because you're adding white into it as well, titanium white. And that's the thing that I think is kind of difficult for a lot of beginning artists to wrap their head around is the fact that ivory and black, you would basically consider them as additional colors, or I should say black and white, ivory black and titanium white. You would basically consider them additional colors because they are kind of within a color family. They're within the blue family, a very cold family. Um, whereas other whites and blacks, such as flake white, would be over in the warm yellow family. Um, Mars black would be more in the red family. So even colors that we don't typically think of as colors per se have color cast to them. And that affects the way that they mix within the colors that are either across the color wheel from them or the colors that are right next to them, analogous within the color wheel to them. Um, you can see by looking at the mixtures that are found within the Zorn palette that you can find a pretty good range of violets to muted greens, yellows and oranges, um, warmer reds, and then cooler reds and violets. Um, they're all desaturated, obviously, as we look at these other examples of the same palette. These are all desaturated versions. I think the cadmium red's the brightest color we've really got out of this entire palette. And then here we even show these three colors mixed with the third color mixed in. The two colors mixed, I should say, with the third color mixed in to show the range of what you can get within desaturation down here. Um, but it does give you quite a nice range for how you're going to mix your colors and what you're going to come up with. This is probably one of the nice examples for showing just the basic color palette and how it mixes across. So essentially, when you see something like this, you can see why ivory black, we say it's in the blue family. You can definitely see that kind of blue cast compared to all these warm tones over here. Um, when you mix blue with red, that's how you end up getting violets. When you mix um, red with yellow, you get oranges. When you mix yellows with your blue again, that's how you end up getting these greens. And if you have more of the blue, in this case the black over here, then you're going to get a colder green or you're going to get a warmer green. It just kind of depends. So the limited palette that we use within our class is made up of ivory black, raw umber, burnt umber, Indian red, burnt sienna, and yellow ochre. There are a few things I kind of want to discuss about this palette before we start moving through the rest of the slides. Um, you'll notice what I've done is the pure colors are these ones that I'm notating right here with the mouse. You can kind of see them as you go through. Um, this palette is set up so that the values should be fairly similar all the way across in these rows. Um, I will show you on some other things some adjustments that I needed to make to this palette once it was done. So you can see, like if you're kind of judging these values right here, you can see probably that this is a little bit darker. As you look at this, you might notice that this feels a little bit lighter. 
Um, the other thing you might even notice is that this feels a little bit lighter as well. This is the pure yellow ochre. I couldn't really do a lot to change that because I wanted to leave it the yellow ochre. But as I use it, I just kind of keep that in my own head as I'm going through. I could, I guess, lighten all of these to match it. Um, but I wanted a certain range happening, so I didn't do that. What we did is with all of these colors, anything that is essentially below the color is a tint of that color. So down here are grays. These are all tints. Titanium white, which is mostly out right now here, but titanium white mixed with black ends up giving us the range of grays, and you can see how cool those are compared to everything else. Titanium white mixed with raw umber gives us this range of raw umber tints burn umber tints. And then here with the Indian red, the burnt sienna, they each have a shade that's mixed above them. We'll talk about that in a minute. The tints underneath though are mixed with white. So Indian red plus white makes these tints right here. Burnt sienna plus white makes these tints right here. Yellow ochre and white makes these two tints right here. For the shades, what I did is I really paid attention to what color families my original colors came out of. And then instead of, if you know the definition of shade, it's black plus any color. Um, so you add a color, you add black to a color and you've got a shade. But I've kind of come up with my own version with that because I really don't want a lot of like mucky darks. And sometimes mixing in a lot of black into all these colors just um, isn't always the best alternative. Alternative. So what I do is I mix one of my three darks, whatever one of these three darks that I have here that are in the correct color family to mix with this color. So Indian red is actually mixed, and I'll show this to you on the color wheels in just a minute, but Indian red is mixed with ivory black. And we get this really wonderful like dark maroon violet color. Um, it's really nice uh, for shadows and so on. Burnt Sienna is in the orange family, orange red family, and I mix that with Burnt Umber, which is also in that same family. Um, so I get a really nice kind of dark reddish brown. And then Yellow Ochre is kind of in between families. So, well, it's yellow, and it's in between the Raw Umber and the Burnt Umber, because this is more of an orange and this is more of a yellow green. But what I did is to vary this, just so I don't have a whole bunch of like Burnt Umber looking shades up here. I mix this one with raw umber. So I use these three shades and I mix one of these into each of the colors. Indian red with ivory black, burnt sienna with burnt umber, and yellow ochre with raw umber. And that gives me this really wonderful kind of variety to my shade colors up here. This is a great palette for working on um, still lifes. It's very desaturated. You don't have a good strong blue in it, but a lot of the other colors you can actually get very nice. And if you control your warm and cool relationships within the painting and have a lot of warmth or orangey tones nearby, you'd be surprised at how blue this actually looks. If you look at this image right here, this is one way that I tell you guys to check your palette. So these are two photos that were taken with my iPhone. Just after I mixed the palette, I took a photo and then I put a filter on it. You can do all the dramatic warm or dramatic cool or whatever you want. I use the monochromatic photo um, filter and I put that over it. And then I think it becomes really apparent as you look at this, like how this is darker than these other values here or how this is lighter than these values as well. Um, you can even see the yellow ochre right here as being a little bit lighter. It can be hard sometimes to see how these values are interacting. They don't read quite as easily as the lighter values do. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just knock my exposure up and that helps me compare these a little bit better. It exaggerates the differences a little bit. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it should be pretty close. And the reason I say that is because these values lining up and all being approximately the same, that's one of the things that makes painting this this um, painting that you have to do so much easier. If you remember when we worked within black and white and we worked within the monochromatic that we talked a lot about figuring out a value range for the light side of our form and a value range for the shadow side of our form. If we've decided a certain area of the form is like a value four and we want to shift color temperature and we're constantly trying to mix between these colors, you can see that it's just the way that your eyes judge value can be different based on like the desaturation or saturation level of that value. It can make it hard to see. And you're constantly moving, you're painting, and you're constantly mixing, remixing, remixing. So if you have these all figured out in your palette later, 
and then you think I'm going to use some of this raw umber and block in this area of I don't know this sphere that I feel is a four right here but I want to make it just a little bit warmer sometimes I could hit just a little bit of this yellow which is the same value into here I'm not going to do anything to break up the light the way that the light is reading on the form and the volume at that point if I do that all I'm going to do is be able to shift temperature and create a little bit more color complexity in what I'm doing without ruining the, the feeling that I have for volume so that's part of the reason why these all need to line up the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that this palette if you kind of think about it you'll realize that this end of the palette is less saturated this end is more saturated this end is cooler and then it gets warmer and then it's a little bit cooler and it gets warmer again. So there are a lot of kind of trends that happen within this palette that are set up in a way to be logical and to help you to work very quickly and easily with what you're doing. These are just some examples of various paintings and so on that people have done that use palettes that are really similar to what we're using in class. The violets and so on in here, a lot of times people will think they need to go get a tube of violet paint. But the reality is that this type of violets here can be mixed very easily from the palette that I showed you guys just now. Um, these violets can be made using the Indian red and the grays. You just add more gray if you want it cooler. These reds right here can be made from mixtures of the Indian red and the burnt sienna. The greens are really easy to mix between the blacks or gray tints off the black and the yellow ochre. So let's just kind of go past some of these examples. Um, these are just kind of showing the difference in how limited palettes might affect your final outcome within the painting and how you control color can really affect it. And let's look at this image for just a second. This image right here shows the way that light and shadow um, divide on a form. We've talked about this a little bit as far as like light logic. What we really want to remember now going into these paintings that involve colors, that color temperature, and even just looking at this photograph, we can see how we've got cooler, more blue here, and how it's got a little bit more of a gray-green cast here, and we've got like some pinks over here, more of a lavendery gray up here, so if you kind of see that even in something that you might think of as being gray and white, actually has a wide range of color value in it, or color um, temperature shifts within it, and it's by using that palette correctly and really shifting through that you can create the same sense of kind of um, complexity to your color and kind of beautiful color range within what you're doing. If we keep in mind also that we always want to separate out our lights and our shadows with what we're doing. So when I look at an image like this, we've got these very simple block ends initially of all these different fruit and vegetable shapes. But notice that the light side is separated from the shadow side. Very different colors sometimes happening. Sometimes a lot of similarity. You can see that the shadow side though within like um, this yellow object over here has a lot more of a brown green area or that you might have laid in the shadow side of this with something close to this color, this color, or even a cool gray depending on what you're doing. This color wheel right here begins to show you the way that we think of color a little bit within, as a painter would think of it. This shows color pigment relationships. This is not what I call a color mixing wheel. I don't mix cadmium orange and cadmium yellow light to get cadmium yellow medium. Cadmium yellow medium is its own pigment and it's just the different way that it's developed versus cadmium yellow light that makes it that color, although it does have the same base of being a cadmium. It's just cooked at different levels or temperatures. However, what it does show is kind of the, the saturation levels. So out here on the outside of the wheel we have the most saturated colors, what we tend to think of as spectrum colors, spectrum as in light spectrum colors. They have the most saturation or richness and brightness of color to them. As our colors move inside, they get less saturated. So here we can see the yellow ochre, burnt sienna, Indian red. These are three of the colors that we're going to use here on our painting. And as they get even less saturated, where they start moving into colors that we don't even think of necessarily as colors, then we get the least saturated of all. So probably I'd have titanium white and ivory black like right here, almost to the middle, but not quite on the middle. They're placed here just to kind of help you understand the idea that they belong within this blue family over here, okay? The raw umber I've put within the yellow green family. It's, and definitely as it lightens, as it interacts with other colors, you'll see this. Um, the burnt umber is over here within this orange family. 
And then you can see on the outside, when I talked a little bit about that palette, I talked about how you could mix yellow ochre with either one of these. They're the closest to it as far as their color families because they're in these similar families to yellow ochre. But you can see if we're going to mix yellow ochre with burnt umber and we're going to mix burnt sienna with burnt umber, we're just going to end up with a yellow brown and more of a red brown. On the other hand, if we mix the yellow ochre, it shifts it over here into the green spectrum and then we end up with a shade color that's a little bit more within the green spectrum, whereas this shade color remains a little bit more over in the orange spectrum, which is nice for us. Um, if we look at Indian red, Indian red, if we're going to look at these two families here, we can see that Indian red actually has to go one, two, three quadrants over to mix with burnt umber, which means it's starting to move further away from it. Think about mixing like cadmium red deep all the way over here. That's kind of how you want to think of it. But if it's mixing with black, it's only going two over. It's going over to the blues. So when we mix these two, they're a little closer, and that mixture between them stays a little bit cleaner, and it keeps a little bit more of the inherent color of the red happening within it. Um, this is right here. This is just something that I created for somebody who was trying to explain color temperature. And I've included in here because it really does help you kind of see like how color temperature shifts. And actually I forgot to say about this. One thing that I do on this is I put my cool warm division here. Some people will move it over a little bit over here straight to the cobalt blue. I used an ultramarine blue deep for a long time from Daniel Smith that was um, for my classes that is very kind of a violety blue. It's very cold because it's the ultramarine blue deep. And that's how this division ended up here. And I tend to think of like yellow orange, like that sunflower yellow kind of color as being warmer even than a real orange um, is. So this is where my division is. Anything that's moving closer to this is getting cool. Everything that's moving closer this way is getting warmer. So it's all about that relationship. Sap green is cool compared to like a cadmium yellow medium, but it's definitely warm compared to like a phthalo green. And so you can see that there's warms and cools within all the color families. And as they shift closer one direction or the other direction that shifts. And so that brings me back to this slide again, which basically is showing you some of that relationship. All I did was just put straight mixtures of like a cooler yellow, a warmer yellow and orange. So basically yellow, orange, red, um, red violet, violet, blue violet, blue, uh, blue green, green, yellow green, and so on. And then I showed these, I took these colors, these main colors that I had out here, I put them each down at a certain percentage going down um, and less and less saturation to kind of show a lot of times when we get into this range, people will look at a color like this or this and they'll all just think of it as gray. But the best description I can give you is to go to like the paint aisle at Home Depot and look at their gray cards and you'll realize that there's a lot of variation to gray and there's a lot of variation to white colors that we typically think of as not having any color at all. Some of that is you just learning how to develop your eye as an artist and some of it is starting to understand this whole idea of color families. So... Um, I switched out my other slide, but I forgot to switch the, this one. So rather than redo this lecture a fourth time, just ignore this pile. This pile is the raw sienna pile, which you guys no longer have. But you do have all the rest of these. And you can see that the way that these are mixed, um, it, that it goes right back to these color wheels and what we were just talking about. Okay, so just reviewing, we mix the Indian red with ivory black. Mix the burnt sienna with burnt umber. We mix the yellow ochre with raw umber. And you can see how this is a little bit more yellow green. And this is the grayscale version of it, so you can see what it looks like as a grayscale. I think this one I mixed a little bit better overall. Um, value to value. So this is just kind of a reminder. Um, and this goes back to what I was talking about as far as having all these values match. Because remember I said, if you're going to pick something up out of this number four pile here, we've got two, four, six, eight, and nine tens up here. Um, and you pick something out of this four pile, but you've mixed it wrong. You can see how this is a little bit darker here than some of these other values. It's going to shift the way that we read light within that object as well. So it's really important that you remember that even a slight difference. Right here, they've taken this 
um, number six value and they've placed it against all these other colors, even a slight difference going from a six to a four can make quite a bit of difference compared to what how we're reading our values. So it's really important to keep our values as we shift colors correct. As we look at value to color, this is just kind of showing us that idea that we're going to have to mix shades of some colors to get all these values to match. We might have other colors that kind of are in the middle, like this red hue right here. It's in the middle, and then as we mix tints or we mix shades, and then the blue is a darker color inherently. Um, most blues, I should say, not all, but most blues are darker colors inherently, and so that darker blue is going to be darker in a value scale as well. And that kind of explains why we've got yellow ochre down a couple notches here in the sixth level. We've got um, Indian red and burnt sienna up here, and then we've got raw umber, burnt umber up here in the 910 row. Okay, so the rest of these are just examples, and I wanted to kind of go through some of these examples with you. These were all the ones that were done from still lives. They weren't done from photographs by different students. Um, you can see that some students have done a really nice job with colors, with controlling certain portions of what they're doing. I don't necessarily think any of these paintings are perfect. And usually, uh, maybe it's just me being overly picky, but usually within a painting you can find things that you would have liked to have seen a little bit more. Like I would have liked a little bit more direct reference to the light and shadow in this. I feel like it's very soft sometimes. And they did a pretty good job of maintaining control and still building volume. But the sharper edges, along with the loss of shadow, um, a direct like shadow and light hitting the forms can make it harder to read. However, their unification of the light plane within here was really nice. Their development of the drapery overall was really nice. So they did a nice job of not creating so much contrast that it makes this light plane within the ground plane of um, drapery feel like it's an ocean you're going to get seasick on with lots of waves. You can see this one has a little bit stronger light and shadow. Yes, I think there are times that this could also have been softened down, but it's a much more direct kind of understanding sometimes of the volumes, which is nice. Um, a little bit of oversimplification in some places, but a lot of things that are really nice about this rich color tends to happen nicely within this as well. And this one, the same still life, a different student, has a lot of complexity to color. Sometimes it breaks up the light space a little bit too much. So, um, at least for my taste, you know, so it just kind of depends. Um, sometimes it gets a little bit busy. I think it's got a lot of nice complexity to it, but it does get a little bit busy. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, this one has a really beautiful sense. This is one of the ones that really does a nice job of holding the values together within a light area, but shifting between like their burnt sienna tints, their gray tints, their raw umber and yellow ochre tints to create a lot of complexity on this silver terrine um, and a lot of like beauty to what's happening within that area, but maintaining the sense of volume that's happening. You can see how the gray kind of reads a lot like a blue within here. They did a nice job with a lot of these drapery volumes and keeping a good sense of, um, of the roundness of the form happening. This is a little cold, and you're going to see what I mean a little bit later on. Um, but it, I probably would have warmed this up a little bit with a little bit of raw umbers mixed in here, maybe a little bit of yellow ochre as I think the light side of it had had a little bit more of these kind of color casts would be nice. Beautiful control though of like the color going behind and the transparency here. So some nice examples. Some of these are really recent from like last semester. Um, others are older, much older ones that I've been showing for quite a while, but some nice kind of understanding of how to control color and value and so on. Really rich color sometimes in some of these. You'd never look at these I think and look at them and go wow they only had like three colors and they all look like they were things that somebody dug out of clay. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm kind of looking for, a nice sense of kind of separating out lights and shadows and a really soft kind of cool light coming in here. Um, a lot of complexity and so on happening within this one. This one has a really nice rich sense of color to it, beautiful sense of kind of getting the metallic properties happening within this, really rich color for the most part within these different areas of color. Things I would fix as far as like maybe rounding out some of the forms and getting a little bit more complexity as far as like uh, this light form kind of hitting here and ending it feels a little bit odd. So little things here and there. 
beautiful sense of handling some of the metals in here for beginning students. These are great. Um, the control of like the effects here within some of the background glass and the background are really nice as well. Same still life. Notice the difference in the backgrounds. This one's got a warmer background. It's kind of a mixture, a blend between umbers and grays. And this one's got a little bit cooler background. It might have a little bit of umber in it. It doesn't feel quite so cold, but it does have a lot of the gray in it. And you can also see the difference in the hook here where it's very brown toned. Whereas here, it's a little bit more monochromatic and yet feels more metallic too. Um, this is a nice one from a little while back. Really rich sense of kind of bringing a lot of color into this white drapery. Um, nice uh, feeling for a lot of the color overall within like the background and so on here. Um, this one as well, it's, a, it's very gold. I will say this is a silver terrine. For those of you that haven't seen this terrine yet, um, it's a silver terrine, so this is very gold, and I probably would have tried to make it a little bit less yellow in tone, but some nice feeling for some of the color and volumes within this. Uh, this one as well. So I just wanted you guys to have a chance to kind of look at these and see the different ways that people solve some of the same problems that you guys are going to have. When you see these greens in here, by the way, these greens are mixed using gray and yellow, and I think that's the thing that's really kind of surprising. Obviously that raw umber mixed with the yellow makes a really nice kind of olive green, but you actually get a little bit better green, I feel, out of mixing certain values of the gray with that yellow ochre. It's a little bit cleaner sometimes. Um, so I would just keep that in mind. Uh, that's how you get that. Um, nice, really rich greens back here in the background within this. So it did a nice job of trying to capture the light coming through um, this red chalice kind of glass onto this pumpkin. Um, overall, what I'm really looking for on these is that you guys really try and understand and get the correctness to the colors. Uh, this is probably one of the ones that's very close to the original color of that terrine that we paint. Um, and really get a nice sense of light and shadow built. And it's one of the big mistakes that people make as they go into color is they just dismiss light and shadow as being secondary because they get all caught up in making a beautiful red or a beautiful blue or green or whatever it is. And they totally let value go by the wayside. So that's really what I want to encourage you guys to do. I think this one has a beautiful sense of color range within this um, the drapery here in the background, really keeping it feeling like it's a monochromatic white or cream colored drapery, but just beautiful color. And this peach is really, really nicely handled as well. So some of these paintings are just very nice. They have a lot of great things happening with them, great control of color, richness to them, a lot of different styles, which is one of the things I'd like to include when I show you guys these images. Um, beautiful color back here. So ben, essentially what she did was keep a lot of the Indian red within these areas. And as she came into here, she used some of the burnt sienna and then a lot of the yellows within it. And um, the yellow ochre mean, was very isolated in here. So it felt um, much warmer, possibly even with just a tiny bit of white in it to make it feel brighter. So um, remember, as you lighten up warm colors, if you just use straight white, they're going to get very cold very fast. And so you want to lighten up using yellows and yellow tints in, within there. Um, these are all from that same still life. There's some nice uh, color range within some of these areas. Breaks up the um, a little bit of the light plane, but they were trying to get the tarnishing on there too. Um, same thing with this. So breaks up the light plane just a little bit because the values jump a little bit in here. But the tarnishing also makes some of those areas a little bit darker. So can't really fault them for that. Um, these were really nicely handled, a little bit more simplified. One of the things I love about this painting, like there are areas within it that feel a little bit stylized, but this is beautiful right here. The wide range of kind of goes from burnt sienna tints to like yellow tints, yellow ochre tints, um, a lot of grays. And you can see how that gray, which is a blue, and then the burnt sienna, which is an orange, they're complements. And so they really become these accent colors. Um, very nicely to each other within here and then how they shifted into the browns and grays here and then this really toned down um, desaturated yellow ochre tint here um, probably some raw umber or something in that as well that makes that feel like a reflection and it doesn't jump out and feel like it's competing with the highlight it's one of the things that come, becomes really important as you guys work on this painting 
is that you understand how to control like these reflected lights as well. I think one of the things I love about this painting, I think the background and the skull were handled nicely, but especially this cone, they did such a nice job of creating a lot of color temperature using that number two um, value line in their palette and just moving between the different colors and getting pinks and grays and umbers and yellows and yet um, really building a richness to the color of that white pyramid that they had in there. Um, this one, again, the egg here feels a little bit cold as well, as well. In just a minute, I'll show you one where they don't do that. But a really rich violet that they mixed with their Indian reds and their um, grays. Nice job of keeping separate their shadows and their lights and getting a nice sense of detail sometimes. Um, this one did a nice job of staying very warm toned and really letting this feel blue against the rest of it. Um, another egg right here that feels very cold. So look at this egg and notice how gray it feels. If you'd actually added a little bit of this umber in, it would have sat a little bit more naturally within the still life. But it also, if this were warm also, this would even stand it even more as being blue. And this is just built with that gray, um, just painted with that gray tone in there. This one does a much better job of controlling the warmth within that egg so that it sits more naturally within the environment and it doesn't compete with the object that's blue and has some warms in it because of the reflections. But this definitely is the coolest part of the overall painting. You can see that they got a really nice control of like greens in here. And then this was beautifully handled as far as making this white feel very natural, not cold like you see um, in something like this but a much more natural white with some umbers and so on in here. So, and not to say that there aren't some wonderful things about this painting. I think they did a nice job of really controlling a lot of the drapery, of getting a lot of complexity what they're doing. This was really nicely handled. Um, so I don't mean to just be pointing out things that are wrong. Um, but there are some really nicely handled things and then everything has something that they need to work on too. Um, this one I'd say probably increasing some brightness within some of the drapery here would have been nice. This one did a really great job. This is a great example of showing what happens when color goes behind something else that's transparent. So if we, it, it just seems so logical and simple to me, and yet um, it's something that I, I think sometimes people get very intimidated, intimidated by is doing transparent glass. But essentially, just look at these abstract forms and don't overthink it so much. And keep in mind that when you've got something like yellow drapery going behind brown glass, that as the glass gets thinner, you're going to see more of the yellow mixed with the brown. And as the glass gets thicker, you're going to see more of the brown mixed with the yellow. And when it gets very untransparent, such as in this, this case where the glass is very thick, you just see the brown. Okay, So if you think about it logically, as the glass gets thinner, the the brown glass is going to have less of an impact on the yellow, but it's always going to have some impact on it. So what you want to do is as you move this behind, as you paint, I always recommend as I'm working on something transparent to also work on the surrounding areas, especially the stuff that's going behind that transparency. It becomes really important so that as I block in this yellow, then I can come through and mix some of this yellow in here and I can get this relationship correct because that's what I want to do is make this feel like this transparently is looking at this. So it really helps if I'm painting these at the same time. Um, this one has a really nice sense of kind of really maintaining their light and their shadows nicely. Good, rich sense of light and where the light direction is coming from, even in organic shapes like flowers, which can be difficult for a lot of people to do. Um, they manage to do it. You can see here where the greens or the violets go behind this. Um, it's basically almost a clear glass. It's kind of a yellow glass um, little vase that I have. It's toned down the the violets, it's toned down and made these greens just a little bit more yellow and it helps build that transparency. So that's basically it on that. Um, the reminder is that as you keep working on this palette um, that you really want these lines to match up. Make small adjustments if you notice. Like I did go through on this palette and lighten this one up, I forgot to go in and darken this. So I kept having to remix and remix and remix. And I mentioned that in the next one as well. But just make sure that you get these to adjust because it just makes it 
it's such a, a much easier use for you if this is all mixed out and you can just move around these um, different colors so easily compared to values.